let's be clear, I, I, I think that sign was reflective of general opinion in Libya. I was talking about Libya. I wasn't talking about Afghanistan or Pakistan or Iraq. I think each of these countries is different. The fact is, when they held elections in Libya six months after that sign went up, out of 80 seats, half the seat, I mean 80 seats assigned to parties, half the seats went to the moderate pro-American party of Mahmoud Jibril. A quarter, in other words half that amount, went to the Muslim Brotherhood. And the Salafis, the most extreme Islamists, got one seat out of 80. I think that tells you quite a lot about I Libyan opinion. And what I'm trying to say is in Libya, I think we did a lot to support Libyan freedom, and there was some appreciation for it. In Iraq, the situation's been very confused because the war has been so bloody in the aftermath. But Syria is the real lost opportunity. In the early stages of this Syrian uprising, people were actually burning the picture of Nasrallah, the, the head of Hezbollah. They were burning the Russian flag. They were burning the Chinese flag. They were burning the Iranian flag. Uh, now, I think the disappointment at the failure of the West in general, and the United States in particular, to do anything other than spout pious words and go to the UN for useless resolutions has really embittered people. And uh, the Shia of southern Iraq were deeply embittered by the fact that we abandoned them back in 2003. I'm not saying that what people think is all one or all the other or that it's simple, but I think it matters what people think. And I think when we say, well, the famous words of James Baker about Bosnia, by the way, the Bosnian population are Muslim as well. And we left them alone for three years, although eventually we saved them. Baker said, we don't have a dog in that fight. It makes you think of Neville, Chamber Neville Chamberlain saying about Czechoslovakia, it's a quarrel with Germany. It's a quarrel in a faraway country among pe between people about whom we know nothing. <coughs> Look, there are times when it's good to stay out of quarrels in faraway countries between people that you don't understand. But I think in, this, in, in the case of this true, um, it's not just the, the, first the upheaval in the Arab world, but more broadly this, if you like, contest among the world's Muslims. And I'm oversimplifying. We're talking about one and a half billion people with many, many different views. But let me take Indonesia, which is a country I know very well. Uh, was their ambassador there for three years, and I think I have admitted publicly I almost fell in love with the country, virtually did, and have been back there a lot. Over 200 million Muslims in that country, and the great, great majority of them are tolerant, do not want an Islamist state, a state where people are forced to uh, practice the Muslim religion, much less the Wahhabi version of the Muslim religion. It doesn't take a large percentage of one and a half billion people to have a number of people with extreme views, both extreme in terms of how they view their religion and extreme in terms of how they view non-Muslims. I think one of the great challenges, um, it's your generation, as I said earlier, more than mine, one of the great challenges is how to empower what I think is the great majority of Muslims to make their views the dominant view in spite of the fact that the other view is the more violent one. It's not always easy to stand up to a minority if that minority is, is prepared to use violence. But I think that's the challenge. It's a very complicated one. Some of the, ex I, to be honest, I couldn't hear all the details of your question, but I agree with you. It's, there's no simple picture here, but there's a very important picture where we need to try to influence the outcome.